to deny vulnerability or to build resilience, to observe challenges or to act upon them, to find the light or to stay in the darkness. Every day of our lives, we're presented with numerous possibilities, options, challenges, crossroads. In many ways, we exercise agency over the things we can do and what we can control. But what happens when we become mere bystanders to the grandiose forces of nature, when despite our best efforts, we're humbled by these forces? We are all familiar with this concept of things that were taken away from us. Going to your favorite restaurant, eating your favorite food, getting a haircut, taking your significant other to the cinema, to the movie theater, taking your children to the park so they could play with others, birthday celebrations in the outdoors. All of these became absent luxuries. Why? Because of this. COVID-19. COVID-19 was an undeniable force, and it took the world by storm. Since January 23rd, 2020, when the first case of COVID-19 was identified in Canada, virtually no one's life has been the same. With increasing number of deaths, largely due to respiratory infections, uh, we have lost our senses in many ways with the fear. And containing this phenomenon has become of vital importance to the preservation of human life in Canada and the world over. And with 40,000 deaths, as I stand for you and speak in this very country, this virus has made us to reassess our priorities. I like to, you can see the illustration there. Now, there are certain features of COVID-19 that truly stands out. The first is a sense of imminent danger, an invisible enemy that we cannot see with the naked eye, that it's out there and it can get us. Second is panic, this overwhelming fear of uncertainty about the present and also about the future. Third, imminent danger. COVID-19 directly elicits responses to our adaptive and innate immunity. And it's very unpredictable how this virus acts in different age cohorts. And fourth, contagiousness or transferability. When you have an uninfected individual and an infected individual in close proximity, this virus through the aerosols, so these liquid droplets, can easily transfer. And as it does, it can also mutate. You have different variants, each of which could be resistant to different therapies and vaccination. That was a micro level. Let's talk about the macro level. How does it affect society at large? One of the features that I can notice is communication breakdown. With the flood of information, peer-reviewed articles, it was very difficult to separate truth from falsehood. This flood of information really made us think of how should we act and how should we behave in this course of pandemic with very serious consequences if otherwise. Shifts in mental health. We've seen several speakers talk about stories and I will share mine too. But there's no question that the strain by the pandemic directly affected us whether it was work, whether it was school, we felt that strain. Anxiety, depression skyrocketed. Choices versus priorities. As a citizen of this country, how should I act and how ought I behave in relation to the different policies of the nation? So at some point, I need to let go and relinquish my liberties for the benefit of society. Also, what constitutes an essential business? and what should be closed. These were some of the struggles and the questions that we face as a nation, so did the world. And of course, mass mobilization. For policies to work, we need citizens to be active, to follow guidelines, and to do what is best. And we saw that. Now, it, it, it still boggles my mind when we think of coronavirus. What are we really talking about? This is a strand of hair. We all have it, uh, for the most part. Uh, this is a Fine beach in the sand. This is a red blood cells that carries nutrients. Where can we find COVID-19? Right there. I'm supposed to not move, but I'll do my best. So something at the micro level, 10 to the minus six meters, uh, can really elicit a change that covers the entirety of this planet, of all of the populations of the citizens of the world. And it's remarkable to think and contextualize this. Uh, very briefly, I don't know how many of you have seen the coronavirus in real life, but what the name suggests is this green projections, these spike proteins that it attaches to different cells. And it comes from the word Latin, corona, meaning, la uh, meaning crown. So you can appreciate that viruses are the living border between life and death because they must infect a host organism in order for them to function. And they must replicate their RNA in this case so that they can continue moving forward with that cycle. Now, I cannot stop but to also show you how this manifests to the body. So you can appreciate two different images. These are chest x-rays. And not to make things complicated, but help you, this is our windpipe, it's our trachea. And it bifurcates, you have two different lungs. It's flipped in this image, the right side points to the left side. 
and what you can appreciate in two different individuals, one is 29, one is 56. Uh, the lungs start to develop these opacities, like someone is like erasing them with something, and it, it gradually covers. In this case, it's in the lower left zone, and it progresses. It progresses to the entirety of the lung, and we can also appreciate that trend in the figure on the bottom. Okay, so we have a sense. So who am I? I'm a medical student, and it was an absolute honor when I first got accepted to medical school. It was a long, arduous journey, having lived a nomadic lifestyle in three different countries in five different cities. Tehran, Vancouver, Berkeley, San Francisco, and Toronto, I had finally received the acceptance to my dream school. But there was a hesitation there, because with the state of the pandemic, there were many questions that I had. Would I be physically moving there? What would the curriculum look like? How would I learn medicine and transfer it? How would I meet my classmates over Zoom screens? Right? But at the same time, I recognized the immense privilege it takes to be in a position to use your hands, your brain, and your heart to directly intervene in life-changing conditions to prescribe medications, and to help people in very critical states. And, and another part about medicine that we have to appreciate is that medicine is not just theoretical knowledge compiled in textbooks and lecture slides. Medicine is about the human dimension. It's complex, it's raw, it's multidimensional. And there is one story in particular that I want to tell you about. It's the first death that I observed as a medical student. If you talk to any healthcare professional, they will always be able to tell you with granular level of detail what that event was like. I was in my first year of medical studies last year. A very compassionate and caring physician was teaching me. And I remember being in this uh, geriatric center with this uh, individual who had just passed and the physician told me the clinical pearls and the things I had to know. And then we were supposed to go into that room together. And he asked me before we went and he said, someone, are you ready? And I wasn't. What happened at that very moment when I saw that gentleman who had uh, unfortunately died the first thing that I thought wasn't the medicine, I was crying. And it's not the kind of crying that you, you prepare. My face became wet, and I didn't realize why. And as I looked at this man who had just passed, immediately beside him was a frame. It was him with his wife. It was a Mediterranean setting. They were looking at the camera. They were smiling. And it made me think and realize, what is it that really matters in life? What is it really? So in our world, in our life, there is a sense of center. Right now, I'm standing on this red carpet. My brain, my spinal cord, my feet is directly connected to the ground. There's a sense of familiarity. There's something that I understand. And there's many examples that we can see. A tree with its roots disseminating to the bed of the earth. A ship with an anchor at the very bottom of the ocean, stabilizing it. The opposite of this is decentralization. And what that does is it, it's a state of complete drift where you lose that center, and you're not sure what point you're directly at. And these forces are directly acting upon us, and this COVID-19 pandemic was a great illustration of that. You can feel it also when you're at the plane. There's nothing underneath you, and you're not sure what to do. You shake, your feet start to tremble, because we do not know what the unknown is, because we cannot predict the unknown. And that sense of decentralization is unique to all of us during the state of the pandemic. Now, another part about this theme of this conference is the idea of finding light. And I want to argue for you that light is a force that comes from within. It's an inside-out process. You have to excavate through reflection, through thinking, to find that source of illumination. And once you find that, and it's difficult, I'm not going to make it easy, because it, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to really understand yourself and those around you. But once you do, there's a beacon of light. There's something there. And that amplifies with time. And that's very, very important to realize. Because what's the alternative of that? COVID-19 does not have a static core, it changes. And as it changed, we mimicked that uncertainty, that decentralization. We were going up, down, left, right. We had lost our senses of center during this pandemic. There are some perils that I want to share with you. There are not too many, but I will elaborate in fine detail. The first is a duty towards the self. When you think about all of your bodies at the individual level, there are armies of cells that are there to protect you from anything. And there are different names for them. This is a great cartoon. There's B cells, T cells, macrophages. That's not what matters. But what matters and is reassuring is that your body is doing everything possible to keep you alive, to maintain your growth, to stabilize you for a sense of homeostasis. And we feel a sense of obligation towards our body because when we realize what the body is doing for us, we feel obliged to take care of ourselves too for that very reason and that relationship. The second is emotional connections. Our sense of memory, our sense of virtue, the sense that I have of myself of the present, the past, and the future, 
is directly tied like a spider web with the people that are central to our lives, people that we couldn't see during the pandemic, people that we lost. And that's a very, very important concept to realize that what truly matters in addition to that is that emotional bond. And the Greek American philosopher Alexander Nehamas at Princeton University writes beautifully. He says, like metaphors and works of art, the people who matter to us are, so far as we're concerned, inexhaustible. They always remain a step beyond the furthest point our knowledge of them has reached, though only if and as long as they still matter to us. And of course, we have the storm. Within our span of life, maybe within the digits of our hands, there will be experiences that may shatter us, that may bring us to a sense of complete decentralization where the foundations are completely lost. And what should we do? We should stabilize ourselves. We should stand still, confront what there is, not knowing the outcome in any way, extend our arms and tell ourselves that we are here to stay. And do not ever forget how virtuous that is, to not know the outcome, to not have any sense of guarantee, but still be willing to find that sense of center for yourself. And it amplifies like light for other people. And why are we obsessed with these stories? Because deep down, we need to find other stories of people who have made it through, or at least are making that attempt. So we can too. And one of my favorite authors, the Japanese uh, genius uh, uh, novelist Haruki Murakami writes in Kafka on the Shore, and he says, and once the storm is over, you will not remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You will not even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain. When you come out of the storm, you will not be the same person who walked in. So there is a sense of development, there's a sense of evolution that's unique to each and every one of us. And I don't know you, and I don't know your stories, but I do know you because there are certain elements of humanity that is preserved in all of us. And we can connect through that when we reflect, when we re-examine, when we go through that storm, we realize that is a shared human journey regardless of culture, regardless of age, regardless of all the other variables. Okay, so we've established that. I've told you about my life, about my background. I've told you about some features of the virus. I've told you some truly uh, life-changing experiences that I went through. Okay, but why am I here? Why did I travel thousands of kilometers from Montreal to Edmonton to be with you today? There is a reason. I'm 26 years old and for the last really 26 years of my life, I have been thinking about the things that truly matter, the things that make us unique, the things that we pursue, and the reason for that pursuit, why we pursue them. And after a lot of thinking, after a lot of reflection, I can only point to two main fundamental principles. The first is a relationship with the self. The self is an enigmatic process. We live in our body, we embody our body, but there's more to that. And that is a sense of growth, because at every instance of our life, that process is dynamic and it's changing, and it never ends. And it's extremely important for us to connect with ourselves and remember during moments of complete void that the best friend for you is you. So to be able to be at a sense of acceptance, to hold yourself, not knowing whether things are going to be fine at night, but establishing that relationship, because that relationship sets the precedence for every other relationship of your life. The second, arguably equally important as the first, the relationship we built with the people we love, care, and trust in that very same order. Losing loved ones during the pandemic, not being able to see them during the pandemic, made us realize the holes that are filled in from that sense of ambiguity, from that sense of tremor, from that sense of decentralization. And as we live, the people around us that matter to us will be a very strong part of our life. And it gets stick to your brain, to the amphitheaters of your gray and white matter. They're always alive and you can always refresh those memories to remind yourself what is it about your sense of virtue, about the sense of your values that makes things worth living. And truly, what better way to see the world through the eyes of those we love? Thank you very much.